Good afternoon, everyone. I'm mostly going to show you pretty pictures because I know it's late in the day. Um, but I'm a little bit, I don't want to say intimidated, but um, I think I'm a little bit of a, of, a, of a standout in this crowd because I don't come from the policy community. I don't, I'm not actually a technology developer, although I do contribute to technology development. Um, and I'm certainly not from the publishing industry. I am a scholar. Um, and I am trained actually as a scholar of German literature. So it'll make sense in a minute. Mostly today I work with historians and I work actually in the area of digital humanities. And this is where you get my, uh, my, my enigmatic title and my colon in my title. I think that we're almost required to do this. Um, and one of the things I want to do is talk to you about how for me as a scholar, um, the single digital market in Europe is really a market about ideas. It's about understanding. It's about how our shared identity as Europeans can be formed by history, but not limited by it, not determined by it. And I think a very good example of, of how this is a very multilingual question, and a multilingual question that should not be underestimated or simplified, uh, is something that we can see in if we look at our history from exactly 100 years ago. Because those of you who are history buffs will know that exactly 100 years ago, uh, Europe was embroiled in the Great War, the First World War, depending on <laughs> what you call it and when you started calling it that, and in particular in a campaign in the Dardanelles that we know now as Gallipoli. And this campaign brought together combatant forces from five different continents. We know the official languages, and there was a, many official languages in which the records of this campaign are now enshrined and which historians can use. But if you think about the unofficial records, then you start to, to see the true linguistic complexity of an issue such as, such as Gallipoli. Um, and that's not even starting to go into Mel Gibson. Um, I looked around in the Europeana Digital Library. We had a speaker from Europeana earlier today. Hi, Antoine, if you're still here. Um, to find out what some of this linguistic complexity looked like. And I found a couple of things that I want to show you just to give you a sense of, of what wonderful grist there is for the historical mill within Europeana uh, regarding this particular campaign, this particular moment in European history. And one of the first things I found was this wonderful diary from the front in three volumes, an absolutely massive work written in, with great care um, by a Frenchman, a French artilleryman, who is describing in incredibly emotional language what he saw and when he saw it, day by day, allowing the reader to, to move through the campaign with him. But also I found interesting things like this, which is, a German officer who was given a Turkish war medal and sent the Turkish language letter that went with it, which then had to be translated into German. But what's interesting about it is the lower section of the text um, also had to explain the importance of the particular Turkish script and how part of it was handwritten and part of it was, was actually um, uh, uh, printed. So there's quite an interesting linguistic issue even within the single document, much less in the entire record. When we look at documents like this, I start to think about how this data soup, as we call it in the project that I run, this multilingual, messy, heterogeneous record of a contentious time, um, has led to something that, or, or is tied up with something um, that is, is an emerging paradigm of modern history, which is what we call transnational history. Now, transnational history is not a new terminology. It's been around probably for almost 100 years, and it arose through the desire to study transnational organizations like the American Red Cross. There's no way of studying the American Red Cross in a single institutional national archive or other data silo. And the fact that transnational history is becoming more and more of a dominant paradigm now for me is indicative of a number of things. Uh, first of all, I mean, obviously, we are aware um, of, of some of the issues of, of modern versus postmodern history. History is written from a certain perspective. It is fallible, it is human, and we need to be wary of that. But more than that, the affordances of the digital, the fact that historical records are now accessible across borders, across time and space, is quite important for the way we want to do history. We want to bring those records together and work with them in particular ways. We also want to, to reflect the fact that scholars themselves are becoming more transnational. Scholarly careers start in one country, then move through another. The education may be in a different country, and the eventual career may be in a third. 
So there's a lot of, of, of trends that are driving towards the desire to do a history that doesn't ignore the national, but also doesn't ignore the interconnectedness at a supranational level. Now, we also need to remember, of course, that history isn't just the past. And if there's one thing that some of the recent headlines from The Guardian and other places have reminded us, how we talk about history, our access to the records of history, what we, what we, we need to interpret and reinterpret, it's still very much a living thing and still very much a part of an identity in formation. So if historians want to have a very complicated and nuanced view of what is in the historical record, interestingly, and as a bit of a sidebar, this is something that citizens seem to want as well. Because what we risk doing if we take linguistic content from another time and another place and stripping it of its linguistic complexity, um, we risk removing the level of the culture. And when asked in the Eurobarometer survey what um, aspects of Europe created a feeling of community, citizens responded by and large with the fact that culture was really the leading aspect that was felt to be something that brought Europeans together. History is there, values are there, languages are even there, but culture is the thing that leads. And the question is, how can we preserve that feeling of culture? Um, now, this is a, a, a translation I like to pull out. I, it's always good to, uh, to have a bit of a go at Google Translate. Um, because many scholars think, in fact, when we first started building a, uh, an infrastructure for medieval and modern history, um, many scholars thought that we could just plug in Google Translate and it would all be okay. Um, but unfortunately, we lose that complexity, we lose that richness, and we lose that context when we simply plug in Google Translate. And you need to remember that for the people that I work with, linguistic ability, multilingualism, is not just the norm, it's absolutely part and parcel of your career as a scholar. Um, I believe I had to pass exams in German, French, and Latin along with my native English in order to, to achieve my, my professional uh, degree. And this is the norm. So we're talking about people who are not consumers of language technology per se, but really experts. And when the experts look at this, they say, well, of course there is complexity in the the, the way in which different speakers and different people and different um, uh, uh, times and places will approach something as simple as the old Japanese haiku about the frog jumping into the water. But the frustration with Google also comes out when you start to try and use it to uh, translate more um, simplistic text, such as this metadata record from another, another Europeana, uh, uh, an, another um, piece of, of, of what is referenced in Europeana. Uh, the Kipri started the war with the breaches, which I think is very interesting. And when I look at something like this, I just want to say, you know, Google, I'm an expert too. We could do this together. You know, can, can, is there some way to engage with technology? You know, maybe, maybe I'm not speaking the right language to communicate with Google. You know, LOL, I has skills. Um, but Google is silent on this. The good news is, however, I think not every technology is silent on it. And I think with a little bit of collaboration, many people have talked about collaboration today, and I'm going to just do it again. Because I think that with more collaboration between the research community and the technical community, we could start to build things that might leverage this expertise, which is not just the provenance of scholars. There are many people who um, are, are, are well able to work in a multilingual environment and want to do this. So some technologies that have sort of inspired me, um, this is one called Kanjingo, um, which, yeah, I was, gonna, I was wondering if you might know it. Um, this was actually developed by my, my Irish colleagues, my, my Koglaki, if I can throw in the random uh, Irish Gaelic word, uh, at the ADAPT Center. You may have seen their stand at the coffee breaks. Um, and what I love about Kanjingo is that Kanjingo actually allows the, the user, this is for, for post-editing of machine translation, allows the user to actually have some visibility and some control over what is so often put in a black box. It puts the machine translation into more of a white box. But I want more. I want a glass box. And in fact, I more than want a glass box. As a scholar, I need a glass box. Because my job, really, is to create new knowledge. I'm one of those owls of Minerva. Who was it who was speaking? Was it uh, Christopher Pine, I think, was speaking about the, the owls of the translation. I think that's kind of what my job is, is to be one of these owls. But that means, woe betide me if I should use a tool that I don't understand. If I don't know what lies behind my sources, 
then I am not creating knowledge, I'm creating fiction. Um, and that is a different job entirely. So we need to be very aware of what technology can do and how technology can support the, the creation of knowledge around contentious histories and contentious identities across languages, across nations, and across times. Um, another technological development I've been really quite inspired by, this coming more from the, um, the e-learning area, has been this idea of the explorable explanations. Um, and I know this particular one went sort of viral there for a while, and some of you may have seen it or played it. The idea that this, this simulation of uh, diversity could be played and people would come to a better understanding of it. But the one that I really like is this one, Up and Down the Ladder of Abstraction, because it's talking about very um, intricate uh, principles of, of uh, dynamics and motion and engineering. But at every step along the way, the author is allowing his readers to start to play with what's actually happening, saying, here, here's my evidence. This is how I interpret it. Do you agree with me? And I think that that sort of interactivity between the user and the creator, between the author and the reader, between the scholar and the student is incredibly important. And we can view that as something that could emerge in multilingual environments for scholarly research as well. So here's my poor attempt, well, not my specifically. Um, Sundari is an EU-funded Framework 7 infrastructure program with almost 100 people working on it. But I happen to be the coordinator, so I guess it's mine and I guess it's ours. Um, and this is the interface we're working towards for this. And what this is here to do is to allow scholars to harness some of the new technologies without letting them be harnessed by them, without making them accept what they are given by the system without giving them, uh, asking them to give up control of their methodology. So you can see there's nice visualizations, etc. Um, in the final version, there will be control over things like your ontology. So if there is something structuring your search results, you'll be able to control that as a scholar because you need to control that as a scholar. It's not Google telling you what you want to see. It's actually you telling the system, actually, we need to change that because that isn't really going to work for this particular topic. As well, you see that there's many color things highlighted there. Those are my entities. I've, I've uplifted these significant entities myself, but then what I've done is I've gone through and I have resolved them definitively through um, the, um, uh, the DBpedia system. And the reason why that's important for us is not only does it give us a, a, a system outside of ourselves, outside of our own knowledge, where we can actually look at some of the, the, the references that we have, um, it allows us to resolve these across languages. So where we have Gallipoli or Gelibolu, we can actually look at those two. And when we're looking at a mass of information in the system, which the system will eventually have, then we can actually see that those two things are the same for those situations where it has been resolved as the same. And it also allows us to um, feed intelligence back into the system. So the more times that um, the word Gallipoli is actually associated with a DBPB file, the more reliable it gets to be within the system that certain searches are going to come forward. Now, this kind of, of system doesn't come without collaboration. As I mentioned, we have nearly 100 people in Sendare, some of whom are developing the technology, some of whom are from uh, cultural heritage institutions, some of whom are scholars, some of whom are, are traditional historians. And we're all coming together to collaborate, but this could go further. And I think one of the, the messages I would like to leave anyone in the technology sector with, if, if uh, Christoph can advertise his Horizon 2020 project, well, we're, we're constantly looking for partnerships. And we're looking for partnerships across those boundaries because we believe that if we can have these kinds of collaborations between the information sector, between policy, between uh, technology, and between humanists, well, we, what we can do is we can find ways of educating the humanists about their methodologies about educating citizens about their identities, but also about improving technologies. Because again, this whole idea of developing for a certain kind of consumer, this is the sort of thing that, that does bring different kinds of, of worldview, different kinds of creativity together, and which does have the capacity to make for technological innovation, as well as social innovation, or indeed simply the, the innovation of new knowledge or wisdom coming, coming forth in the scholarly circles. So, I will say, and I realize this is slightly sexist, but this is a historic poster, boys and girls, come over here, you're wanted. Um, because 
I do think that although humanities researchers can sometimes be viewed as standing up on an ivory tower and not wanting to integrate, I do think that a meeting like this proves that we can join together, train together, embark together, and develop together towards um, both a more uh, linguistically complex and rich European identity in this single market of ideas. Thank you. Thank you.